Hello, I'm Dr. Heyo Trao, and I'm here to tell you how video games are not a banal pastime or a waste of time. Today, I will analyze a very special role-playing game, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Today, we are reviewing a very special game, a game that influenced a whole generation of gamers. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is a classic RPG game, published by Nintendo and released for the first time for Super NES in 1991. This game is a classic and you most likely have played it or heard about it. I played this game using the Super Nintendo Entertainment System that you can get with your subscription to Nintendo Switch Online. I will start reviewing the story and doing a brief analysis of the narrative. Although I try to keep this as general as possible and not tell anything about the ending of the game, the story might contain some spoilers, so if you want to avoid them, just jump to this part of the video. Well, uh, here we go! So, you are Link, although the game allows you to name your character as you wish. You are living with your uncle when he gets the call from the Kingdom Princess, Zelda. She is in danger and wants him to rescue her. After your uncle leaves, you wake up and follow the same call. Eventually, you find your uncle, who doesn't make it, and take his place trying to save the princess. However, after you save the princess, you are told that you need to beat the evil man, Akenim, which is trying to conquer the world by harnessing a certain power, the Triforce. To defeat the evil man, you need to get a hold of the sacred sword, but the sword does not yield to anyone and you have to prove your worth getting the three pendants representing the Triforce. After you get the pendants, you get a hold of the sword and start your journey to defeat Aganim. But he is not so done for. He has already corrupted a whole world, a parallel dimension to the world you are in, now called the Shadow Realm. He captures the princess and takes you to his corrupted world and a new quest starts. Aganim and his minions have captured the seven sages, which possess the power to seal him away, thus preventing anyone from opposing his evil plan. So you start a new adventure to defeat all of Aganim's minions and one by one save the sages, which help you save Princess Zelda and the Triforce, the last one having the power of granting the wishes of one's heart. The narrative is really the classical hero story. You are the descendant of a powerful line of knights, although you really don't know this in the beginning. Then a quest that is beyond yourself is presented to you, to save the princess. This is the first tribulation of the story, the first arc. This serves as a bridge to tell you what you are capable of doing. Then, in the second arc, you are presented with an even bigger task, which you have to surpass to prove your worth. Also, you are presented with an antagonist, who wants to destroy and establish balance for selfish purposes. After this, the third cycle or arc starts. Now that you have proven your worth, you need to overcome even more difficult challenges and take the story to its climax by defeating the antagonist and restoring the order. I told you in the previous video that game mechanics are the most direct and organic way to foster skills and learning. However, there is another way that is just as direct and organic, and that is design. Game design and world design are the second best way to teach skills. And in the case of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, the strain lies on the design and not on the mechanics themselves. I will focus this analysis on executive functions, which are the set of cognitive processes allowing us to successfully make and deploy plans. There are more or less nine executive functions. The amount changes depending on the author and their theoretical framework. But in this video, I will focus on three. Planning, working memory, and perspective memory. However, this game is long and complex. The sole genre of RPGs taps on meta-representational functions, which are the ones allowing us to put ourselves in another person's shoes. I will also comment a bit on these later on. Planning is our ability to go from our current state to a desired state or goal, and you use it all the time, from cooking to driving to work. Planning requires you to subdivide the main goal into smaller reachable goals, so that a smaller goal or the sum of smaller goals act as a step to the next, until you reach the last and biggest goal. 
Thanks to its design, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past has the power to tap into your planning skills by tactically paving the road to your plans. First of all, you are given a big task you have to fulfill to kill the antagonist. However, he can only be destroyed by special means, so you need a special sword to do it. Once you get to the sword, you realize you cannot just take it. You need to complete three subtasks which allow you to get to it. But again, fulfilling each subtask is not as easy. Some parts of the map require you to get a special tool so you can go from one place to the next. Take for instance here. There is a temple in the middle of the water, but Link will drown if he falls into the water. So he needs a special tool for not to drown. So you need to step aside your main quest and go on a parallel quest, hunting for the fins that allow you to swim without drowning. This sounds easier than it is, as the game is also combined with high levels of exploration. So talking to people or just wandering around might prove useful in the long term, as you can learn where things are and get to them when the time comes. As you can see, all the planning, goal and sub-goal division, and plan deployment is achieved thanks to the game design and the story progression. Now, what is the role of memory in all of this? We are looking at two types of memory in this analysis, working memory and prospective memory. Working memory is the memory you use while you are doing things. For example, it allows you to keep a pattern in your mind while you search for it so you don't have to look back and forth in order to see if you found the correct one. In the game, you are planning and shifting plans all the time. I need to go here, but then I went there. Oh, I found a cave! And what is that up there? I might get it later. Maybe I should go to this other place next. But this character says that I should... Well. You are indeed showered with a lot of information on things you can do, you cannot do, where to go, and even information that appears random but can be important in the future. And to make things more complex, in the third arc of the game, you are switching between dimensions. So you should also remember in which dimension things are, or even if there is a hidden passage in one dimension that will allow you to reach a place you couldn't in the other. This requires you to have a clear view of your goals, a good mapping of the environment, and to memorize where certain items are so you can get to them later on. This also implies that you are always shifting between different information and goals. And that's where prospective memory comes into play. Prospective memory is a weird type of memory, as it is the memory about the future. Yes, I am not crazy. When we make plans, we think about future actions. I want to go to C, but then I need to go to A to get a tool to allow me to go to B, then from B I can get to C. Prospective memory tells you that whatever you are doing now, your ultimate goal is C. C is an action in the future, but it's also in your memory now. As the game builds so much on exploration, remembering the location of places for you to come back in the future is extremely important. Also, as you are planning your routes, you might find big detours or distractions, and it is thanks to your prospective memory that you can get back on track. So, for a quick summary, this game taps on many different cognitive skills, including many executive functions. However, planning, working memory, and prospective memory are being tapped all the time when you play it, making it an excellent choice if you want to foster them. The game also taps a lot into exploration, Exploratory behavior is amazing, as it is a great way to know and understand the world. In the particular case of games, it helps us to understand the particular world and game logic. Indeed, when solving problems, you often use trial and error strategies. These exploratory strategies help you learn the behavior of a system or a system of rules. As a matter of fact, psychologists such as Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky regarded exploration as an important strategy for our learning of physical and social rules. Another cognitive skill tapped by the game is visuospatial reasoning. Although this skill is often tapped when playing any visual game, in the particular case of Zelda games, you have to read maps, adapt them to your current location, and plan routes according to them. This is a particular use of spatial perception, where you have to recognize cues from the environment and translate them to a 2D map, or the other way around. You also use working memory when doing this. 
as after you have planned a route in the map, you want to follow the cues from the real world in order to achieve your goal. You also can find this in the dungeons of the game, where sometimes you have to break a wall or a floor in order to reach a place in a level below that cannot be reached by other means, forcing you to put the map into perspective and evaluate what is above and what is below you. There is also problem solving in this game, both in the form of puzzles but also in the form of strategy making. Each dungeon boss has their own strategy. This means that every time you reach the end of a dungeon, you need to figure out how to harm the boss. Sometimes this is pretty straightforward, as the bosses are normally weak to the tool you find in that specific dungeon. But sometimes it is not that easy to figure out, and you have to try different weapons and strategies in order to do some damage. Finally, as every RPG game, it forces you to put yourself in the shoes of another person. This is facilitated by the fact that you can give the main character your own name. Doing this helps you appropriate of the character, their feelings and take more seriously their decisions. This is not a very complex role-playing game. In future reviews, we will see that for other games the decision system and level of personal involvement becomes critical. There are other ways we can read the game apart from the psychological perspective. These readings can be done by looking at the generalities of the game or by reading between the lines. Sometimes they take the shape of a symbolic representation and sometimes there are specific interpretation of information given to us by the game. Sometimes they take the shape of a personal experience we can relate to. There are two particular metaphors I like from the game. The first is the hero quest. This is an archetypical hero story, where the hero realizes he has an important mission and faces their fears in order to achieve that mission. This can be related to our everyday lives. We all have dreams and goals, and every day we fight for them to become true. Reaching them is not easy and requires us to go out of our comfort zone. Even if it's working late in order to get a raise or going to the gym aiming for a better look, we are in a constant fight. Maybe we are not fighting demons with a sword, but we are fighting for survival, recognition, a place in society, and a meaning for our lives. We are the heroes of our own stories, and these fights take many shapes, but not because of that they are less meaningful. We also have different goals, and some of them are built into steps, just like in the game. For example, if you want to get a car, you need to work hard, which gets you a raise, so the bank can loan you the money for the car you want. Another metaphor I like from the game is the political metaphor. There is a kingdom that is at peace, it is balanced. Then a power thirsty tyrant comes and takes over the rule of the kingdom. The balance is broken and it is up to the few which still believe in righteousness to restore the balance. However, the fight is even more difficult because the bad guy has allies that will protect him in his endeavors, and even good guys will side with the tyrant thinking that is the correct thing to do. The story certainly sounds familiar, and it's because it's archetypical. This has happened over and over again through our history and has been the cause of many wars. Nonetheless, we all, as the heroes in our own stories, try hard to fight for what we believe is correct. Concerning the graphic design, although the game looks very pixelated for our current standards, it was one of the smoothest at the time, so I cannot say it is really pixel art as the intended art was not meant to be pixelated but smooth. The graphics are really detailed indeed. You can see the enemy's eyes moving, sparkles in the eyes and splashes in the water. The game has no real cinematics apart from the intro and the final scene after you have beaten Aghanim. Regarding the music, it is really catchy, and if you are a gamer you know Zelda titles have given the gaming world some of the most memorable tunes we can find in games. Also, in terms of game design, it is a pretty open world. You are guided organically to places by the tools and skills you acquire. Exploration is a keyword, 
and you will need that curiosity exploration gives you in order to uncover the world's secrets and bonus items. Normally, I will talk about problems I found with the game, or about problems I can see in their formal use in informal settings. However, this game is really amazing. It's really a classic and it has aged incredibly good, so I really don't see big problems with it. However, there are two things I think can be improved. The first one is that the game is an adaptation of the original game for the Nintendo Switch Online system which means that when you play it, you are always looking at these commands here. The problem with them is that they allow you to save everywhere and even to rewind the time so you can retry areas without the challenge they were originally intended to have. This can help with some frustrating enemies, like this worm that throws you down again and again and forces you to restart the battle from scratch every single time. But at the same time, this is part of the feeling the designers of the game intended. They wanted you to try harder and to try different strategies to beat the boss, so just rewinding the mistakes takes a lot away from the game. Some bosses and dungeons require you to be very patient. Sometimes you just die at the same boss again and again and you are forced to crawl through the whole dungeon once more to arrive at the same place and try a different strategy. The game can totally benefit from a remake just like other titles of the franchise have had. Then, we won't have to deal with the Nintendo Switch Online system and get updated graphics. The game certainly has potential for learning, and I can perfectly see it in informal settings and schools. Play the game with your children or with your students, and challenge them to create similar games and maps where you need an object in order to progress. The video game will give them a model of what to do, while the analog activity will help them thinking about the goals and sub-goals both from a top-down perspective and a bottom-up perspective. Activities like these can help children develop complex models, such as doors that open with more than one key, and even more, they can foster creativity and narrative and storytelling. If you have not played the game, give it a try. And if you have already played, give it a retry. But whatever the case is, play. Give it to your children or your students and get those skills rolling. If you find my videos interesting, please leave a like or a comment and consider subscribing to my channel for more content.